Rokatuh. Uh, very good morning for everybody who come to the international webinar of remote sensing and geospatial information. And I would like to say a very warm welcome to Mr. Hafiz Alfian Afandi, uh, Ms. Nurul Hazrina Idris from Malaysia, and also for uh, Professor C.K. Shum from uh, Ohio State University. Uh, it is a very honor, honorable moment for us to have such a very good uh, speakers today that will share and, and deliver the experience on remote sensing and geospatial information. Um, actually, at the moment, I'm in the middle of the agricultural field. Behind me is the... Um, turn on the video, and Absolutely. Yeah. Would, would you mind to turn on your video? Sorry. Okay. So behind me is the uh, facility for drying, and we have several others facility uh, behind behind me. This is about seventeen hectares area of uh, field for agriculture testing, uh, including. Um, fruits and also horticulture. So uh, this is an every Saturday um, we are here to conduct several experiments with students. So um, without further ado, um, thank you very much again for coming to the conference and um, I hope that the conference will discuss something and will have something uh, very important for the um, science on remote sensing and geospatial information. And uh, once again, um, for Pak Budi, um, it is a great honor for, for you to have such a very good uh, webinar, international exposures uh, in Mulawarman University. So thank you very much. And uh, I think that's all from me. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning and uh, congratulations for the uh, webinar. Thank you very much, Pak Anton, uh, for the opening remarks and the opening ceremony. So um, we are now in 9.10, so we are really right on time. Even the participant is still counting up. Now we have 20% in the Zoom and will be growing up in the YouTube as well. So. Um, Without spending too much time, um, I will introduce uh, our first uh, speakers, who is uh, Doctor, uh, I mean um, ha Alfia uh, Hafid Alfian Afandi. So uh, Hafid is the solution engineer from uh, S3 Indonesia. And today, uh, he will talk about the communicating ocean and coastal science uh, through geospatial information. So, um, Mr. Hafid, you have about 20 minutes for your talk. If you want to share from your own uh, device, that's okay. Um, but if you also need help, we are also available for help. So, uh, without spending too much time, We'll uh, go ahead and uh, please, Mr. Hafid, to present the first talk. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Budi, uh, for calling me doctor. I hope that will become true. And now uh, I will to present, uh, I will to share about information and our experience in SC Indonesia about communicating uh, ocean and coastal science with GIS. First, I want to share my, my screen.
uh, everyone can see my PowerPoint. Yes, it's visible clearly, Mr. Habib. Okay. Is it double or not? No, it's good. <clears throat> okay. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, first, uh, good morning to the audience. I'm, I'm very proud and happy to be speaker on this event. And I'm very proud to be able from learn from the speakers, Ms. Nurul, uh, Dr. Nurul and Professor C.K. Sam. And as an opening, I'm here representing, represent S3 to talk about our technology that can support the maritime and later, we will also show you about the examples. On this webinar, I want to tell you about ESRI. Uh, about JS in general, modern JS as communication platform and S3 initiative and conclusion. Our president, Jack Dangerman, is a landscape architect by training and in uh, Hartford University and graduate along with Laura Dangerman and his wife. He found S3 in 1969. According to our name, uh, Environmental Science Research Institute, we are a company, research-driven company that spend more than 25% of our annual revenue on research and development. So we can continue to deliver innovative technology that harness the power of applied geography. More than uh, 2,000 2000 users in Indonesia. Uh, S3 is clearly about serving you and our users. That's what we exist for. And my report card to you, uh, we continue to aspire to make difference, not only serving and uh, not only serving you and through you, but also in greater context by contributing to society to advantages and spatial literacy. Our brands in Indonesia, uh, uh, there are four brands in Indonesia, in Balikpapan, in Surabaya, and in Riau. Uh, we are not only take care of our client in Jakarta, but we try to embrace our users who, also, who, who outside in Java Island to be closer and understand more about GS technology. SD, SD Indonesia is very uh, care about our users and to be connected in our technology. We are not only focused on our uh, client, on our commercial client, but we also contribute to the next generation to always be connected to our technology. And this is our greatest uh, investment. GIS is not only about map visualization, but it's a framework that uses special basics, starting from measurement, visualization, and to be able to help us make decision. 
that can be very useful for the general public. If we want to share our information that has been created and delivered to the general public, uh, this desktop uh, is not sufficient to disseminate information active, act effectively because our this desktop is only on desktop. If we want to share uh, in in internet, uh, we need uh, the latest technology. Then and that is is this enterprise and this online. Through the RGS enterprise and RGS online, we made the we made the data more accessible, rela and reliable, as well as easy to access from any device, anywhere, and anytime. This we have known for a long time. is very familiar with. Uh, vector data, or we can call it a shape file, 3D file, imagery, and so on. Technog technological developments and curate GIS technology to be more advanced and able to support all types of data so that it can, it can perform analysis and geo-enabling geo data. We can also collaborate with various special application providers to make it easier for our users to integrate their data. So far, we are very familiar with printed maps. Print maps have helped us from very long time to, ass to assist the development and dissemination of information in Indonesia. But what if we want to display our maps interactively dynamically and able to show our analysis process and easily to access from any platform. That is the advantage of map visualization in a browser, or we often known as WebGIS, which, which is one of the capabilities in our platform in Artist Enterprise and Artist Online. The tools we have developed also make uh, our users easy to perform analysis faster with the help of automation, such as geo artificial intelligence and deep learning. And the process of inter integrating with various external data sources, such as IoT, Internet of Things, or, or we can call it a sensor or other kind of data, such as big data, multi-dimensional data, is also, is also possible for now. Now, the 3D dimension is not only used as a, as a display, but we can use it for analysis and development planning. And then we can also combine it with virtual reality virtual reality technology where we can see the original appearance and dimension an object in the real world. Data with quick update will, would help us uh, work uh, for more efficient in monitoring and preventing unwanted events, not only fast, but on a real-time basis. For the example, uh, a ship is sailing in sailor water. As an officer who monitor the situation, we could control and monitor the track of the ship in a real time. And we can provide information if the ship enters a danger zone. That's uh, one of the example of uh, real time, real time monitoring. Or we can see in uh, this one of this picture, 
that can use uh, real time technology. We also help a field operator to stay connected to the office. The data that has been collected in the field will also be automatically connected to the office and can be used immediately. So we do not need to transform the data. We can use uh, the we can use our daily device such as tablet or smartphone. Our field application can also be used uh, in offline situation. If we in the middle of forest or in the middle of the sea, we can stay connected uh, as long as we covered by GPS location. And uh, this is our example. Our study case for environ environmental monitoring. We could see some example for marine studies. Uh, marine studies uh, such as real-time weather and marine, uh, marine habitat modeling are very close with modeling data and to predict some situation. And uh, we can escape from remote sensing data for our model because uh, remote sensing data is very useful for us to, to analysis, uh, especially in marine, marine analysis uh, will help us a lot if we using imagery data. How about Indonesia? Uh, the Indonesian government is aware of the importance of spatial data. The management to assist development on land as well as in the coastal zone. From the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries, or we can, we, in Indonesia we call it KKP, Kementerian Kelautan dan Perikanan. They collaborate with us, with SD Indonesia to create this application easy to access and very informative. With this application, uh, we can understand the potential and disaster in each region in Indonesia. We can understand and could help us to carry out the development for planning and economic social in the region to live harmony with disaster. And the other cool things about uh, our technology is our Indonesian Navy is already use our technology and they are uh, I'm sorry. Our Indonesian Navy has expert in bathymetric data. The Indonesian Navy has almost reached the entire Indonesian sea and continues to provide updates for bathymetric data. Uh, but some data uh, require special permission uh, to, to access. But uh, we are able to see that development of JS for uh, visualization and analysis of marine data in Indonesia is very rapidly growing. And this is the other case of uh, geo geospatial technology. Uh, this technology can be used for variety of themes for energy uh, in Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resource or ESDM. 
and Bureau of Bureau, Bureau of Statistics or BPS Badan Statistik and Demographic Data and for the lapan or uh, antariksa pener, lembaga penerbangan antariksa Indonesia uh, already work with us uh, to develop geospatial technology. The last but not least, ESRI also play an active role in disaster mitigation in Indonesia. We are directly participate in the field to help volunteers in the disaster mapping. Uh, the last event is on Balikpapan, Balikpapan city where the oil spill uh, in the Balikpapan. Pan Bay and Lombok earthquake. We also uh, join active and directly in the field to help to assist the disaster mapping. And then uh, SRI Indonesia in initiative to help local government. SRI Indonesia uh, develop one map .id. Uh, to help local government share their own portals to their wider community. This portal also helps local government to learn from each other and adopt spatial based solutions that have been developed in other regions. And this is our uh, current, current webinar, but uh, it, it ends in 5 November. Uh, Maybe uh, some of you has, be, has been joined one of this uh, webinar, I hope. And this is a professional de development uh, training for the user. If, we, if, we, if uh, you want to, to learning about geospatial technology in RGIS. And last, uh, this, that's for my presentation. Uh, thank you for the for the time uh, from Mr. Budi. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Hafid Alfian Afandi from Esri Indonesia. It's very interesting that you uh, what you presented that um, many uh, different technologies have been developed by ESRI Indonesia to support all um, coastal and science, coastal and oceans uh, monitoring. All right, we are now in 9.31, so we are really right on time according to the schedule. Uh, we can still have another two presenters right now. So, um, now we're going next to the next presenter, who is Dr. Nurul Hasrina Idris. Uh, yeah, let me uh, present the short um, biography of uh, Dr. Nurul. So uh, Dr. Nurul, Dr. Nurul is uh, the senior lecturer in the Department of Geoinformation, Faculty of Field Environment and Surveying at University. Technology Malaysia in Johor Baru, and she is also a leader of the Tropical Resource Mapping Research Group in UTM, and uh, also an associate member, uh, associate fellow of the Geoscience and Digital Earth Center in UTM. Um, she also uh, do some positions as the visiting researcher in the Climate Change Research Center of Excellence in the University of New South Wales, Australia in 2014, as well as in the University of Newcastle, Australia in 2018, 2019. Uh, she received the award for the Endeavour Fellowship in 2018 from the Ministry of Education and Training of Australia and the UTM Postdoctorate Scholarship to conduct uh, postdoctoral study in the UTM, Newcastle University for one year. She um, has led several national and international collaborative research in the past 18 years in remote sensing, 
and its related technology applications. Her research interest is generally on marine remote sensing with focus on coastal altimetry data processing, physical oceanography from space, technology, sea level rise and climate change, ocean energy resources and renewable energy, and uh, artificial intelligence and remote sensing. So uh, with her rich experience and skills, we are really delightful to hear her talk right now. Um, please, Dr. Nurul, uh, the time is yours in the next 40 minutes. Um, hello, good, good morning. Um, can you see the, the slide? Yes, it's appeared now. Thank you very much. All right, um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Budi Siliosto Adi, um, for the opportunity to give a talk uh, this morning. And I, I believe that this is our uh, very first uh, collaboration. Um, and hope to, to see uh, some, uh, we can further our collaboration among UTM and Mula Warman University in future. Um, also, uh, good morning to the co-speakers, uh, Mr. Hafiz and also uh, Professor Siki Sham, uh, the audience. Uh, selamat pagi, ibu-ibu dan uh, bapak-bapak sekalian. Um, so today I will uh, share uh, about the coastal altimetry over the Southeast Asia and the, the, the presentations today uh, is uh, based on the research uh, that myself and my team in UTM and also University of Newcastle before um, uh, it, when I did my PhD before. So I will share uh, some of the results that we that that uh, we have up, up to uh, uh, today. So um, the presentation today will cover the following topics: um, the basic principles of the radar altimetry, and then we will talk about one of the main issues uh, in coastal altimetry. Uh, which is uh, the land contamination. Um, and then after that, I will show you uh, how the altimetric signals or waveforms uh, and classes looks alike in, the, in our region in the Southeast Asia. And after that, we will talk about the uh, data accuracy and uh, options of the data product, the coastal altimetry data product that we have. And finally, some uh, explorations works. So uh, satellite altimeter is a matured uh, technology uh, that has been uh, providing a continuous monitoring of the ocean since the past uh, 30 to 35 uh, years ago. And there are so many uh, altimetric missions has been put into uh, the orbit. And today, uh, actually, we can see to uh, the technology of the altimetry uh, that can be actually we can divide that into first the low resolution mode or the LRM altimetry, uh, which is uh, based on the pulse limited footprint. So basically, here uh, the, the the size of the altimetric footprint is even larger. And we can, uh, and many researchers has been discussing about the accuracy of the data, particularly over uh, the coastal oceans. And then the second one is the synthetic aperture radar. So this is the advanced technology uh, of the altimetry, uh, which is a beam limited footprint. Uh, so we should expect a better uh, observation observations uh, from this uh, SAR altimetry uh, when compared to the low resolution modes. And um, there are, uh, the, the, the low resolution mode uh, is, uh, we, 
we uh, it is uh, on board of the conventional altimeters. For examples like uh, the Jason series, we got Jason one, two, and three, and then the series of the ERS one, two, and and we set. Um, but uh, for the uh, radar. SAR altimetry, it is started around year of 2010 with the CryoSat 2, which is meant for the ice observations, and then now being extended on board of the Sentinel uh, 3A and 3B, uh, which is uh, fully can be fully used for the coastal uh, and oceans applications. And it is also actually worth to mention that uh, SARA Altica. Uh, is one of a remarkable uh, technology which use the KA band, uh, uh, which is used the KA band, and we can expect a better observations over coastal from these uh, data satellites when we compare with the conventional altimetry. This is uh, they use uh, they usually use the KU band and also C band. So the basic principle of uh, radar altimetry is actually uh, simple, uh, which is based on the uh, on the fact that the time is a distance. So uh, the distance between the the satellite and the surface can be measured uh, when uh, when the pulse is traveling downwards uh, towards the ocean and then upward back to the satellite. So we can transform that into the range parameters, which is also related to the distance from the satellite to the ocean surface. And we can actually also measure the orbital height uh, precisely. Uh, and then based on these two parameters, we can actually infer the information about the uh, ocean surface. But of course, uh, we need to do some uh, data corrections because of the ultimate, because of the signals are traveling. Uh, from the satellite to the surface, they are passing through the atmosphere, and also uh, it need, we need also need to correct uh, the the errors or the contributions uh, from the uh, ocean dynamics, and also other par two parameters that we can infer from uh, satellite altimeters are uh, wave height and also the uh, wind speed. Um, this is the ideal altimetry waveforms. Uh, I call it uh, altimetry signals. Uh, that is ideal where we can usually observe this uh, over a homogeneous ocean surface, uh, which is usually further from the land or island, or uh, usually uh, rougher coastal sea states. And for the, for the conventional altimeters, uh, which is the red line, okay. it should follow it should follows the uh, brown um, model. Uh, meanwhile, for the SAR altimetry, the blue line is, is a, also I, an ideal signals from SAR altimetry. This should follows the, the we call it as a Samosa. Uh, model. So this is an ideal waveform. So it uh, can be well uh, processed using the standard algorithms. And here is uh, examples uh, of the altimetry data coverage. So uh, over the Southeast Asia from the uh, active set, uh, satellite altimeter which is adjacent three, uh, Sentinel 3A and 3B. Uh, we can see that we have a pretty good uh, data coverage uh, with those three uh, combinations of the uh, satellite uh, altimeters. Now, uh, let's talk about the issues on the satellite altimeters over the uh, coastal oceans. So there, there are uh, generally two major issues uh, when we are dealing with the coastal altimetry waveforms, uh, coastal altimetry data, which is the first is about the land contamination. And the second 
second one is inaccurate uh, geophysical uh, corrections, uh, such as uh, the tides and also sea states bias. Uh, but uh, in this presentation, uh, I will talk more on the land contaminations. And here is examples of the uh, altimetric waveforms that are observed from the conventional altimetry, which is from JSON-2, and the SAR altimetry of uh, Sentinel-3A. And the first figures here, and also here, are the ideal uh, waveform uh, that usually observe over a uh, homogeneous oceans. So uh, usually we can get, uh, we can expect a, a good accuracy of uh, sea levels measurement from these uh, types of altimetric signals. Uh, but uh, over other patterns are also observed. Uh, these are uh, the, the others is the coastal waveforms, uh, where we usually see these uh, patterns uh, when uh, the satellites are uh, close to the, the coastline. So we can see an obvious uh, the, how, how the, the waveform shapes are deviated from the ideal to so many uh, patterns, other patterns. And actually, the high peaks there are the reflectance from the land. So it's kind of a mixing between the uh, ocean and the land uh, signals. Um, and this is actually uh, happened when the altimetry's footprint uh, here's examples of the altimetry footprint, uh, where it received signals uh, both from the oceans and also from the land. So within that, uh, the, the simultaneous uh, view uh, of the altimeter in a footprint, so the signals from the land is also being represented in the uh, signals. So usually uh, we should uh, expect that the data from these uh, signals uh, might be inaccurate. Uh, so we need to be carefully use uh, the data. But uh, there are actually uh, techniques uh, that is called as a waveform retracking uh, that we perform on the ground to recover or re-optimize the, the geophysical parameters. Uh, this is usually been conducted uh, on the land before. This is sort of a data, data corrections to, to make the data, to, to recover the co corrupted uh, data. So just imagine that uh, we have a signals uh, coming down and written back to the satellites. And if the date, the if it is over a homogeneous ocean surface, then the the signals or the altimeter waveforms will should usually like something like this. Um, and from these waveforms, we can actually uh, retract or model them based on the standard uh, techniques, standard algorithms, or standard retracking algorithms. And we can get accurate uh, information that is related to uh, the sea levels, which is in the middle of these uh, signals, the, 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 sharp, uh, the, the sharp rise. So that's the middle location is related to uh, the sea levels. Um, but uh, in a case when it is over coastal, for example, uh, this is a uh, waveforms over coastal with the impact of the lands uh, there. And then let's say this is the locations of the actual um, uh, actual locations that is uh, related to the sea levels. And then we retract that using the standard uh, model, okay, like a standard model. So basically, uh, the locations of the uh, uh, sea levels has been uh, shifted. And we can use the altimetry uh, waveform, we can use the retracking techniques where we can correct these errors uh, by applying the more appropriate uh, model. So from there, we can estimations from the onboard satellite uh, systems. Now, uh, let's see uh, some examples uh, of the waveform patterns over the Southeast Asia. 
Um, this is uh, examples over North Kalimantan. And we plot uh, two uh, tracks, uh, which is from Sarah Artika and also from the Jason 2. And here we can see that uh, the, the waveform, the ideal waveforms from the Sara Altica uh, exist uh, beyond two kilometers from the coastline. Uh, meanwhile, uh, it's about six kilometers from, from the uh, coastline for the JSON 2. So this is due to the fact that uh, the size of the JSON 2 footprint is uh, even larger than the Altica. So the JSON 2 is using the uh, KU band, while Altica is using a KA band. So the size of the altimetry footprint is, is slightly is, is smaller for Altica. So the impact of the land is, is not as severe as uh, on the JSON 2. And here is another example on uh, of the waveform shapes for the SAR altimetry. So actually for SAR mode uh, altimetry, uh, we can expect that the data is even better than the conventional altimetries because it could provide a higher resolutions of the, the data. And we should be able to get uh, the data much, much closer to the coast. Um, but um, that, that, uh, outs that, that expectations of the high resolutions about 300 meters is uh, expect, we, we should expect this when the satellite direction is along, along the satellite. Uh, so, but um, different cases uh, is, uh, we see dif different uh, performance when the satellite is uh, um, nearly parallel to the land where uh, the where usually the spatial resolution across the satellite tracks is similar to uh, the low resolution mode of uh, altimeter which is around uh, seven kilometers so uh, because uh, southeast asia has uh, so many islands and lands especially like uh, peninsula malaysia in which the orientations of our uh, peninsula of malaysia the the the, the orientations of the land uh, is uh, nearly nearly parallel to the uh, satellite tracks, so um, the, the, we we tend to see that the resolutions is only about uh, seven kilometers. So this uh, case uh, over Peninsula Malaysia is also similar to Sumatra, uh, where the orientations of the the, the uh, Sumatra is also parallel to the uh, satellite tracks. So for example, in this uh, diagram, we see that uh, coastal waveforms appear uh, within the seven kilometers uh, from the, the coastline. It is not up to 300 meters. This is uh, when we plot the distributions of the uh, waveforms over the Southeast Asia. Uh, so the red one is the coastal waveforms and the gray one is the oceans waveforms. And we can see that over Indonesia, especially over this part uh, where there are so many uh, coastal waveforms there. So this means uh, that uh, the data should be used in, in caution. Because when, when, when we further classify these waveforms, we got three different classes. So class one is the, 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 the ideal waveforms over open ocean. So we should not see any problems with that. For class two and class three, especially class two, it appears um, uh, so, so many within uh, two and four kilometers from uh, the coastline. So, um, it is pretty crucial for our region in the, the Southeast Asia. Now, uh, let's see uh, how accurate uh, is the data. So we will have a look at the accuracy of the conventional altimeters first. 
Um, this is when we plot the percentage of valid data or data coverage uh, over uh, from uh, over the region uh, from the standard uh, product from the standard product. So the blue one is when the data coverage is less than uh, fifty percent. So and again we see that uh, this is a problematic. Uh, this is the regions where we saw uh, less data coverage. This is from the Sara Altica. And we, we further analyze uh, the data that we have by uh, dividing the regions into uh, five seas. So we got Andaman Seas, uh, Gulf of Thailand, Strait of Malacca, South China Seas, and Sulu Sea. And here we can see that the Sulu Sea has the, uh, the lowest uh, percentage of valid data, meaning that it has a low data coverage uh, due to the shallow water and uh, complicated area. And here it shows that the data is only available uh, probably beyond uh, four kilometers uh, from the coastline. But uh, differ from differ way from the South China Sea, where it is has it is a less complicated region where we could get uh, better data coverage and the data can even uh, much closer uh, to the coastline. And here is examples when we conducted the comparison or validation with data type gauge. Uh, at one stations in uh, Kota Punoi station. And this area is actually uh, less complicated. So we could found uh, we, we could find a, a pretty good agreement between the altimetry and the uh, target data. So we, ex we, we, we calculate the the correlation uh, of the data, target data with, with, the, with three different uh, retracking algorithms. So this data is basically can be obtained in the standard data product. But um, we found different uh, findings at Langkawi Island. So Langkawi Island is situated at the Strait of Malacca where uh, we cannot find any uh, relationship uh, between the tight gauge and the altimetric uh, sea levels. So uh, when we look at the signals of the altimetry, here uh, we suspect that uh, this is due to inaccurate uh, geophysical corrections, uh, particularly the, the tides. Um, and this table uh, actually shows when we conducted some analysis uh, to compare the sea levels, uh, um, the, the detiding de techniques uh, from uh, different uh, detiding models. So actually these techniques got GOT 4.7, FAS uh, 2012 and DTU 10. Um, uh, we can get this data in the data products. Um, but when we apply that, we can see that the, 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 the standard deviations of the SLA residuals uh, within five kilometers is, is still large, uh, which means that uh, the, the, there might be the uh, tidal signals being left in the altimetric uh, signals. But uh, point-wise techniques is a, a technique that we use based on the Anderson technique. Uh, so we, through that technique, we could be able to get uh, slightly better for the purpose of uh, tidal uh, corrections or detiding uh, techniques. Um, for the accuracy of the SAR altimetry, so here we first made a comparison with the geot, geot hike. So and we, we computed the standard deviations uh, of the residuals between the Samosa plus uh, retract sea levels uh, with the geot hike. So we found that within uh, six kilometers, uh, the residuals is pretty large, uh, which is around, which is more than one uh, centimeters. 
but it is improving uh, when we get uh, further from Hi, the I'm Kyle, line. an education major and student. Um, here is exam an examples of the um, sea level profiles from that we plot from different uh, algorithms. Uh, and this is when it is crossing the coral atolls. So we see that it becomes noisy. And some of the algorithms that uh, being used is uh, misestimated the, uh, the the sea levels. So uh, this is the the also one of the problem when we use the satellite altimetry over coastal oceans, particularly when the area is having a coral. And uh, we compare the standard data uh, at one of the target stations in Kolak, and we found uh, this is pretty good agreement actually uh, with the data type gauge. So let's say if one is intended to use the altimetry data for coastal uh, explorations, what might be the options that we have? So uh, in the Aviso website, actually, we can opt for a coastal altimetric product instead of the standard altimetry product. So what is a coastal altimetry product in the Aviso website? We can get a free access, it is freely uh, download, uh, to the Pistach product, which is the uh, Pistach product is for Jason 2, and Piki product is for Saral Altica and also ALES. So these are a good uh, uh, choice of the uh, altimetry data for uh, coastal uh, applications. And for the Sentinel, Sentinel-3 A and B, it can be downloaded through the uh, GPOT European Space Agency's uh, website. And this view radar altimetry uh, toolbox is uh, an open source uh, software where we can conduct a basic uh, processing uh, for of, of the uh, radar altimetry data. Uh, but here in this presentation, um, I would like to share uh, the systems that I've been developed over the past 10 years, uh, which is we call is at as uh, the, the chorus. So chorus is stand for coastal altimetry waveform retracking expert system. So um, in this system, actually, we are trying to optimize, uh, produce, uh, we're trying to produce uh, the accurate uh, sea levels, particularly over coastal, by combining uh, different uh, retracking algorithms. Uh, and we use a fuzzy expert system uh, to make uh, decisions on the data analysis. Uh, so the system is actually uh, two, uh, got uh, two important uh, um, operations. The first is um, it search the optimal retracker to reprocess the waveform. And that is assigned based on the analysis from the fuzzy inference system. And second, it minimizes the relative offset in the retrieve sea levels when switching from one uh, algorithms to another. And we use, uh, we introduce the neural network uh, to these uh, solutions. And in this system, actually, we introduce the neural network technique to handle the issue of uh, data offsets. So, why is this uh, crucial? Uh, it's because uh, we combine uh, different uh, sea levels from different uh, retracking algorithms. But the thing is uh, combining uh, different retrackers is not as straightforward because it got an, an offset uh, in different uh, techniques. Uh, so um, we need to remove that. Otherwise, the, the final output of the sea level will have a jump. Uh, a, a, a big a, a jump uh, and it is uh, will affect our uh, data accuracy and 
the, the data precision. Uh, for examples in this figure, so the red line is the, the from the one of the algorithms, retracking algorithms that is called as the threshold. And the green one is the standard uh, techniques, the standard uh, retracker, which is the MLE4. So we can see that uh, there are obvious uh, bias or offset between those two uh, algorithms, which is probably nearly about uh, 40, 40 centimeters. So we cannot just simply uh, merge these uh, uh, profiles. Um, and the neural network is introduced because our analysis has found that the, the value of this offset is a function of the significant wave height. So that the, the, the offset is not uh, but uh, it is a uh, variables uh, which is varies with the variations of the uh, significant wave height. So here we introduce a neural network uh, technique. This is how uh, the chorus uh, generally works. Okay, um, let's say that we have uh, the waveforms data. So we will process the waveforms data and then we will bring it into the neural network uh, framework uh, where we basically train the neural network based on the, the waveform, the, the sample data samples. So in chorus, we consider uh, three uh, techniques, retracking techniques. The ML4 is the standard retracker. A sub waveform is the, the, the coastal wave coastal retracker that we developed back in 2013 and modified a uh, threshold with different. So we will train this um, and, and basically in this framework, uh, what will happen is that we try to uh, learn about the relationship of the offset uh, among those uh, data so that we can remove that uh, later on. And the output from this framework is um, the, the train uh, neural network. And here we also uh, classify our waveforms uh, into uh, here six classes. And, and then what we do is that we define the retracking precedence and prioritize the retrackers based on the classes, the waveform classes. For example, that uh, for class one, uh, we will retract that using the ML4, and then after that, sub waveform, and then after that, more threshold 30%. Um, and so this is uh, basically shows that um, the, the chorus will actually go through uh, three times of uh, iterations. Um, for example, during the first iterations, class one will be reprocessed using ML4. And then class two to five uh, using subway form and class D using the mode uh, threshold, the 30%. And this will, uh, during this first iteration, it will come uh, to produce the sea level anomalies. And then there we will apply the trained neural network to handle, to remove the offset. And it will bring to the fuzzy inferior system uh, to analyze the quality of the data, the sea levels. And here it will make the decisions. If the high, the data is having a high quality, then it means that we will keep the data. Otherwise, it will go back uh, for, due, for the second iterations. Uh, until uh, the end. And this is examples of the output uh, from our chorus. So we can see, so the, the, the top figures here is the sea levels. Uh, and the bottom here is the quality that we analyze using the in fuzzy inference system. So here the black line is during the first iterations, blue is the second iteration and gr yeah, green is the third iterations. So you can see during the first iterations, there are 
uh, several places where we found the data is having a low quality. Uh, and this is also represented by the, no, the noisy uh, sea level profiles. And during the second and data quality and, in, and also improve the, the, the precisions and the accuracy of the sea level profiles. So that green lines is the final output. So you can see how it is being improved uh, from the first to the third uh, iterations. Um, we then analyze, uh, conducted some accuracy assessment to analyze the output from our chorus. So uh, we can, we're pretty happy with the performance at this stage where we found the more data coverage, more valid data over the Southeast Asia uh, using the chorus system when compared to the standard uh, data. And we can reduce the data gap uh, even uh, closer to the coastline. And this is example, uh, the, the tables of the target validation where we assess the accuracy by comparing or with nine stations around the Southeast Asia. And we found that uh, chorus is better than MLA4 and ICE1. This is the standard uh, retrackers at six out of uh, nine cases. Uh, and the correlation is reasonably uh, acceptable. And the RMSE is a smaller, is smaller than uh, 20 centimeters. So we're pretty happy with the performance of chorus uh, at this stage. And here is uh, just another examples of validation at uh, station uh, Kota Punoi. And we see here from this table where, uh, and uh, actually this, uh, this temporal collation, we slice that into several uh, coastal uh, distance bands. So we can see that uh, the standard MLE4 uh, uh, is, unavailable for the when, when it is come very close uh, to the coastline. Meanwhile, uh, chorus uh, and also uh, has a uh, coast chorus has good agreement with tight gauge. It's performing better uh, than the ice one. But we see that in some cases where ice one is also uh, better than uh, our chorus system. So now um, this is uh, some of the applications uh, that we have been uh, conducted using the coastal altimetry product. Uh, and, and the first applications is that we, we, we studied the coastal upwelling. Um, and and it, this is, uh, in this study, we use the Altica data. Uh, actually first we map the sea levels and then we overlay that using the uh, wind speeds and uh, the directions. And from this study, actually, we 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 plot uh, we we observe the coastal upwelling event over the east coast of Peninsula Malaysia, which has happened very close to our our coastline. So it's basically happened um, the, the the events is developing from June July. Uh, August and also in uh, September. And our second application is on the uh, ocean renewable energy. Uh, this is we joined with the team of uh, marine marine engineering, where we use the Altica data for assessing the wave energy resources in Malaysia. So here we could be able to estimate the wave period. Uh, based on the significant wave height from the altimetry. And then we could estimate and model the monthly average uh, wave energy uh, in Malaysia so that we can learn the, the climatic conditions. Uh, here's the climatic conditions and the estimated wave energy that we might expect. And through the study, uh, we could identify the zones that have a high potential 
as a wave energy farms. So at least we we can, we understand where is the, the suitable uh, locations when uh, government uh, is intended to have a, a wave energy farm uh, in Malaysia. And here is another ongoing explorations work under a research grant from our uh, university, which is on the coastal vul vulnerability assessment uh, towards the climate change impact. So uh, we use the, in this study, we use the coastal altimetry extensively for quantifying the coastal sea level rise uh, together with the tight gauge data. And then also uh, to analyze the wave height variations and uh, the tidal range. So uh, in this project, what we are looking forward is to cast and also to forecast uh, the uh, climate uh, conditions in, in, in Malaysia and to look at the, how vulnerable the, our, our coastal. So in summary, the standard altimetry data, for example, the MLE4 or ICE retracker is uh, found insufficient for coastal oceans at the Southeast Asia. And it has low percentage of valid data and large no data gap, uh, probably beyond seven kilometers uh, from the coastline. So for coastal uh, explorations, uh, consider using the options of coastal data product, uh, such as Pistach for the Jason 2, Pispiki for Sara Altica, Ales, or also uh, Chorus. Um, I think I get uh, to the very light slide. I would like to uh, take this opportunity to invite all of you to Johor Bahru Malaysia next year. Uh, we are holding, we are hosting uh, this international Conf Asia Pacific conference, um, the 15 Pan Ocean Remote Consensing Conference. Uh, it has been postponed. Uh, we don't, we do not have a new date yet. Uh, because uh, or because of the COVID, but uh, we still we still open for the abstract and also the physical tutorials. And coming soon, uh, in 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 addition to the physical tutorials, we are holding also um, an online course uh, on ocean remote sensing towards a resilient climate in uh, February uh, to, to uh, 2021. So we are open for uh, registration. And also it is uh, good to mention that uh, we do have uh, scholarships uh, to support uh, the travel, uh, travel, uh, traveling particularly for early career scientists and also students uh, from uh, developing countries. Uh, so we hope to receive uh, applications from Mulawarman University. <laughs> Okay, I think uh, that's all. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your attention. Um, may I? Yeah, very comprehensive. Uh, we learned a lot about the satellite altimetry and the development and the recent development that uh, you already been doing. So um, again, we learned a lot. So thank you very much for the talk. And if you don't mind, um, uh, I believe most of the participants will, will be very happy if you could share the, the slides to the participants, maybe in PDF format or something. So yeah, sure. uh, again, we really open for collaboration research, Dr. Nurul, especially uh, with my background with satellite telemetry for the inland water. So we still have uh, very less, very, very much less um, research on that topic. So I believe uh, we will have very good collaboration in the near future. Yeah. So uh, today uh, we also already have uh, Professor Shum and we also have here uh, Dr. Johnson Lumban Gaul from IPB University. I believe Dr. Nuru also know yeah, him very well, well. Uh, because he is, <laughs> he is also one of the leading scientists in Indonesia for satellite altimetry. And um, as an additional information, um, we are now trying to develop a kind of community for the uh, altimetry scientists in Indonesia. So ranging from the coastal applications like, like Dr. Johnson, 
uh, me for the N Island Water um, applications and many others for Geoid and uh, various other applications from uh, ITB University. Well, um, I believe this is kind of a little bit hard topics for most of the participants because uh, most of them are coming from geospatial science or even uh, general science. So uh, your explanation about the introduction on sortiment, satellite altimetry will be very helpful. Okay, without uh, spending too much time, can I check the audio and video for uh, Professor, Professor Shem? Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Shem. It's very yeah, nice to see you again you. after about <laughs> almost seven years oh, right now. <laughs> it's <been> long. <laughs> okay. yeah. All right. So, uh, Professor Shem is... Um, a professor and a distinguished university scholar from the Ohio State University. Um, his expertise, his, his expertise is more on satellite geodesy, uh, sea level, satellite oceanography and hydrology, geodynamics, and ice mass balance. Um, he's really uh, one of the uh, leading professor in the field of satellite altimetry. And I also learned a lot from him during my PhD in the Ohio State University back in 2009 to 2013. So thank you again, Professor Sham, uh, <laughs> for that moment. Um, he's also um, contributed in one of the Nobel Prize awarded to, to the IPCC and Al Gore in back in 2007. Uh, he's got uh, a lot a lot more uh, awards, including including the Fanning Mains Medal from the European Geoscience Union for the research in GRC applied to sea level science in 2012. And um, he has published over 300 journal articles and book chapters uh, in various uh, leading journals in the world. So uh, I believe, um, CK has uh, more things to uh, con okay. convey today, and yeah. we will be happy to, to see your presentation. Okay, so I should <clears throat> um, share the screen, right? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Let's see, share the screen. Please share. Right, the slide is appear already. Okay. And uh, uh, you have about forty minutes uh, for your talks. Okay. During I'll the be, call I'll be quick. Um, well, thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, so um, what I'll be uh, talking about, although the topic uh, of the conference is uh, altimetry, actually I will go beyond altimetry and I will just do a very quick, um, very quick introduction because I don't, uh, I try to save a little bit time and didn't write, up, write down a lot of words on summary. So um, Dr. Idris, is that how you pronounce your name? Very nice talk. So she's been working on altimetry. So for example, this is the JSON-2 satellite, Topaz. So it's on here and Cryosat-2 is also one of them. I will also be talking a little bit about the gravimetry, space-bound gravimetry. Actually, this is the waste follow-on satellite that you see. And also I'll be talking about a little bit about the uh, 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 synthetic aperture radar actually uh, dedicated to, to actually work on uh, wetland with vegetative wetland, uh, sea level. Sea level. Uh, and then another topic I wanted to touch is actually G GPS or GNSSR, but it's the refractometry. So, so this is the, the um, so-called multi-path that everybody geodesists want to get rid of. So, so, so this is becoming a very hot uh, research topic and this, the signal is not big. So I just have some uh, examples. So 
So the topic over here is that it doesn't really matter what sensor that we wanted to use, but the focus now is something on application, meaning we wanted to actually detect, uh, find the feasibility of using these sensors or combination of these sensors, uh, try to um, monitor, for example, water resources and, and flood and so on. So um, actually I should probably skip this um, slide, but this is the principle of satellite altimetry over ocean, actually over lake as well, and even over land uh, or ice sheet. So we have this repeat orbit. So this is actually the, the, the picture over here, Jason, sorry, this top is actually the radiations over here. So, so basically this is a repeat Orbit, the so-called repeat orbit here is, is like 10 solar days, uh, about 9.9 sidereal. So we could make change of the hydrolic level, changes to the water level and so on. Actually, that's easier said than done. Um, and I, I could just, I'm not gonna go into details. In the ocean, we know very well, in a deep ocean, like um, Dr. Ad, Ad, uh, Address was talking about um, coastal ocean, that's a very tough problem. And, and with large lakes, uh, you get a lot of data products in altimetry. No one actually try to remove the gradient and then also on with us. So this is a research area, probably like a Buddhist research area. All right, so you have the track. So I wanted to talk about some uh, applications. Uh, we actually done this quite a while ago, um, 2008, it's a former student, Hong Ki Lee. So this is a dam in, in Turkey. It's the very big dam at the upstream of, um, like up, upstream from Syria and also Iran and Iraq. So, so a track over here, color coder is actually the height. Uh, so you basically could sort of measure the water level across this dam, but obviously there's gonna be a very, uh, very variability. Anyway, so, so what I wanna show this is that it actually monitor people, um, changing the water level, meaning anthropogenic. So the, um, the wave over here, the lake over here was damped up to become a reservoir or damp. And then the water start filling in because they have to rely obviously on rain. So you could see this is human filling in water because they damp everything up. But then you could see this and you say no. So these are natural. So when you have a, sea, uh, when you have a rainy season, it goes up. Dry seas, uh, uh, the other part, then it goes down and so on and so forth. And then you see the drought over here. So this, this is a, actually a drought, not really uh, that they let go of the water, you know. So, so, so this, this actually has applications in terms of water security, water policy, and so on. And I could give many more examples. So we actually did a project uh, recently with uh, NASA over here. We, um, along with Mike Durang, who's a hydrologist at Ohio State University. So all these points, so, so these are the data we call virtual stations. Uh, this actually is an animation, but to save time, I, um, so you could, you could put it on a Google Earth. So here is the Google Earth. And then I'll show the, uh, sorry, uh, later on another uh, visualization, but I, I don't think I'm gonna go to the web. Um, so basically each of the points, so we have dams in India, for example, Bangladesh and, and over Tibetan Plateau, and it's actually all over the world. So you, you, for different, uh, for example, for this dam over here, uh, this white um, dot, you could see the seasonal variation. And so this is ME set. Another ME set, I'll take her, which is follow up with ME set at 35 day repeat. 
in the in the Krishna weather over here. So um, right here, and then another dam over here. They are, so this is also the question of wafer, but JSON too. So, so we have multi satellites. All right. So this, uh, this is a screen dump of the web. Actually, if you type, uh, let's see, is it here? Hmm. Oh, okay. So, so here, here's the, here's the link. If you click it, uh, it's called Ultimate Virtual Stations. And this is a abbreviation. You'll get to the next one. Actually, this is, uh, but this only has currently large wafers. There's no dam and other, other things. So, so you could actually click on each one of them and then get a time series and you could download the data. All right, so quickly. So I wanted to now um, talk about this uh, gravimetry and, and the whole acronym is uh, gravity recovery and climate experiment. So the short form, short terms called waste. And now, uh, 2018, um, NASA and, and uh, German, Germany, GFZ has launched the grace, the so-called grace follow-on. So, so if you look at this, this is a satellite over here. I'm just going to illustrate basically these two satellites uh, separated by several hundred kilometers and the altitude is by 500 kilometers. And then there are two identical satellites and, and they could be uh, actually in the change. They actually, they did that after the uh, satellite gets all they split, uh, switch over, this becomes the first satellite and the other one becomes the actually as well, the laser link. So the accuracy, the precision of this link is a uh, micrometer. Uh, for um, laser, it's supposed to be about 30 times more accurate. So uh, let's see, maybe I'll skip the equations. Basically, this is one technique where you, you actually measure the change of the potential. Um, the JPL, JPL engineers who build a spacecraft has a nickname for these two satellites. Uh, they call it Tom and Jerry because the satellite is like the cartoon. The cat and the mouse, the cat should never catch up with the mouse. Otherwise it's game over, cartoon will be over. All right, so, so long story short, so this, so this is one scenario only uh, up to about 14 years of data. So this is one graph, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, meaning that we fit a slope or a trend of the time series. So in a way that's, for example, in Greenland, you could see the ice melt in Greenland and then West Antarctica over here and then Antarctic Peninsula. East Antarctica, you actually see gain because there are a lot of uh, snowfall. For hydrology, uh, we, we don't have trends, right? So, but however, because of the short time span, sometimes you could see this uh, signal over here and signal in the Midwest, uh, Midwest of United States is actually flood signals. So this is a 2010 Mississippi flood because signal is so large, it, it looked like a train. So this is the Alaskan glacier and, and these two regions here are actually groundwater depression. So it's the Middle East. And I'll, be, I'll have a little bit more detail on the, on the water resources side of the application. So you could do a lot of interpretation, but one thing I would do, okay, it's not here yet. So, so there's an examples of glacier. So this is the so-called high mountain glacier. By the way, this number gets slightly larger as you increase the time, uh, but still, um, uh, uh, so it's five gigaton is a lot, minus five gigaton per year. So over the span of about 14 years, you could see the seasonal, and then it, it's basically mostly losing, uh, the ice is losing, melting. Um, the only uh, glacier system that's basically advancing is the curriculum in uh, near Pakistan and the uh, Western Himalayas. 
the rest of the rest of the world, all the glaciers are melting. So Bodhi, you may want to tell me the time. Hopefully I won't go over too, too, too much. So Canadian uh, Arctic glacier, so it's minus 58 gigaton per year, huge melt. So, so now I show this one uh, proper size uh, applications of the um, gray satellite is basically its ability to sense something underneath the earth, like groundwater, right? So, so as we know, uh, we don't have uh, any uh, whole lot of ways to measure it, except you dig well deep into the earth, you can measure the groundwater. So there's a, there's a caveat, there's an assumption over here that, so this is, let, let me show all the regions. So this is the old uh, result only up to 2017 or so. So for example, this area, uh, this is at the foothill of the Himalayas in India. And this is another, there's another region that has not shown uh, a time series. So basically you could see the, the ground is uh, depleting. Uh, how do you, how could you compute all the groundwater? You have to know the surface water and subtract it out from the base data. So grace is gravity, it, it sees everything. Uh, whether it's ice, whether it's earthquake, it, it sees everything. And you could see this uh, Australian artesian plane aquifer, you could see very strange, depression of water suddenly recharge and go up and then come down again. So the trend over here that you see on a figure does not really do any justice to this kind of phenomenon. You can't tell unless you actually look at the time series. And this aquifer in, in um, South America is sort of the same, very interesting. It's had very good seasonal signal, but sometimes it's small, meaning rainfall is small. The recharge is, is a lot smaller. The high plains in, in the, in the uh, United States actually is one of the largest or the largest aquifer. You can see very complicated, like drop down, draw, and then coming up again. So, um, what, uh, so we, we talk about hazard. So uh, land or water is also hazard and groundwater is a drinking resources. It's very important for uh, irrigation. Um, Basically, I don't think it's a problem in Indonesia or Malaysia, right? You have a lot of water. And uh, <laughs> um, okay, so let me let me do some close up and a little bit more detail work. So it's basically these three areas. So we were interested in Bangladesh. So this is the nation uh, boundary and Performotra, uh, one of the largest basin in the world and then in the Swiffer Basin is over here. So you could see all these complicated uh, groundwater is actually groundwater storage is in red. Again, we have to remove a model, which is SM. It's like soil moisture, TWS meaning gray data. So you have to know, so if the model is wrong, your groundwater is wrong. All right. So uh, pretty famous hydrologists published a lot of papers on this. All right, so the other thing we're talking about flood. So this is still the gravity data. And if we process the data in a way that um, we only, instead of monthly solution for those of you um, understand the, the grace data is only like monthly. Uh, here we just like make 10 or 11 day solution uh, from level one data, we do our own immersion and then we move over one day. So, so this, is a, this is basically an example that we could actually, sorry, we could actually see, um, we could actually see the evolution of, of flood. So here on, on a green uh, or the, or the a slight, uh, light blue, these are droughts. So for example, in this region in Bangladesh, they, they actually have droughts every year. They have a lot of water uh, in the same year and it floods, uh, for example, one third of the country. So this is drought in India. Well, 
I'm gonna show is like 2008. This is a huge. There's a huge Indian flood. Uh, Indian continent flood actually originated from Bangladesh and Mirawa. So you could see the huge. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot of water. So so Grace actually measure the weight of the rain on the land and create actually the loading effect. So the the crust moves and Grace is able to catch it. So the signal is actually quite small in terms of gravity unit. So with this, you can actually look at evolution of the flood for um, in, in a day. So this huge flood actually lasts pretty long. So you can actually measure it very well. Um, I actually did something in Indonesia, but sorry, I couldn't find it. Um, I, I could send it to Budi later. So, so try to try to um, look at a flood. So uh, keep going. So this this is out satellite altimeter application. So I, I don't know whether you know this term. It's called land cyclone or land hurricane. So this is the city of Chicago in October 20, uh, 26, 22, 27, 2010. So basically, this is like a, a like a cyclone over land. Uh, well, people said this is because of climate change. So th this has the, one of the lowest uh, barometric pressure even for hurricanes over the ocean. So the idea is that we wanted to see whether we could see these uh, snow over the Great Lakes using satellite imagery. All right. So so this is the. Uh, so you can see it's, it's like a hurricane, but it's over land. Our cyclone is over land. All right, so I'll skip over this. So now I, I'm gonna do a little bit detail. So, so this is actually not the, all the altimeters we have. Um, and since it's October um, 2010, these, some of these satellites are no longer there, right? Um, but uh, so, so the yellow lines you see is 35 day repeat. And the red line you see is the topaz JSON is like 10 day repeat. So you could see the spatial. Um, so when you have more frequently sample data like 10 day repeat, you lost in space. So you cannot cover the whole uh, Great Lakes. So this is the Lake Superior, the largest lake of the, uh, the Great Lakes system, which is which is the largest freshwater lakes in the world. And then uh, I, uh, we put in Sentinel-3A, actually Sentinel-3B is also like um, uh, there. So you can see the green line it, it is, uh, I believe it's 28 day repeat, right? Uh, so you have very different tempo, um, tempo distribution of altimeter and in space. And then we, we, our idea is what well, our hypothesis try to say, oh, you got this hurricane on land marching through this lake here. So all the river, all, all the lakes would be uh, a lot of wave. We want to see whether we could detail it. So actually we 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 could detail it like with this ascending pass. So meaning the, the satellite, Jason, Jason to satellite goes up and come down again near the Edge the, east, uh, the eastern edge of the Lake Superior. So I'll show the results. So this is a actually it could have been plotted a little bit dramatic, dramatically meaning changing a scale here. So you you actually so this is this is the the lake uh, pass for Jason two, but it's not it's not during the storm, and this is not during the storm either. So this is actually during the storm. And this is all the storm has passed. You could see by your naked eyes that this seems to be has higher variability. Okay, so, so but the signal is only about nine centimeters deviation. You know, if you compare with like six, six centimeters in the normal times, all right? So this is a visualization of like before, before the uh, storm, so you have this these uh, pass color coded passes, but during that storm you can actually see these 
sort of uh, nine centimeter up to ten centimeter uh, changes. But this is lucky that our team member could see it. So, so basically, it's an exercise. So you, if you detect it, so what, right? You 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 can't really see all this evolution of these uh, storm signals. All right. So let's move on. Um, so can you actually see um, grays, uh, which are for this particular typhoon? Uh, it's called Winsanti that went into South China and, and so on. So you. Uh, by the way, uh, gravity waves is like 300 kilometers half wavelength. So the pixel is 600 kilometers. So versus uh, radar altimeter at several kilometer footprint. So this is like uh, two orders of magnitude, two cores, right? So however, you could, you could see during the, the time. So this is basically the rain hitting on a solar earth. And then the solar earth we, uh, responds because of elastic loading and the gravity satellite measures it in space. All right, so let me move on. Uh, so this is another, this is basically making each day uh, marching through and you could clearly correlate the, the, the red, uh, which is uh, a lot of mass gain uh, with, uh, with basically with a storm with a lot of rain on land. Oops, uh, sorry, this is not supposed to be there. <laughs> All right, so I want to quickly talk about this uh, new technique. So some of you may know, so this is an exaggerated uh, GPS receiver, GNSS receiver on land. Obviously, it's not going to be that high. So basically, you have multi-system GNSS. Basically, let's just take um, GPS. So it had a refreshion over here and then it bounces. And then this receiver could catch the uh, multi-path signal. For example, if a bounce happens to be bounced on the, on, on the water, then you could measure sea level. It bounces on the water uh, a lake, you could measure lake level. If you, it bounces off um, like snow surface, you, you have a chance to actually get snow depth. So this is the so-called signal and noise ratio method. Uh, the first person who wrote a paper on this is uh, Christine Lawson. She retired already, University of Colorado. So basically a very simple um, schematics is that you know, need to know this geometry and then you also need to uh, do filtering of this. So it only uses one frequency, right? a phase data. So you have to really know uh, what the signal in the ocean is and then do a periodic one and filter out. So I want to talk about the satellite. So Cyclone GY, uh, CY, Cyclone GNSS is a NASA like XRI constellation, but it's only like single frequency. So it's supposed to speed, uh, study the wind speed. And some of us are try to try very hard to do altimetry, but the cold range altimetry the accuracy is at a several meter level. But you can also do like phase altimetry, which is which uh, arguably could be under one meter. So this is research ongoing, all the data are free. And uh, so you, for some of you who are interested, you could look into this. All right, so I would, I would do a very quick, um, but let me skip uh, on a theory and show you some results. So this is a student, Jing Sun, did his dissertation in 2017. All right, so what he did was he, uh, so this is Lake Huron. Uh, we talked about the Great Lakes. So there's the GPS receiver um, next to the water, next to the lake. And then it also has a, has a water level gauge. So you can see the, the so-called tide gauge is water level gauge. Don't know whether you could see it. The color is not very good. It's the the black line and the GPS water level gauge is following it. So there's a lot of filtering, long story short. The data are quite noisy, but if you filter it, if you make monthly averages, it actually has something like four or uh, six or um, 15 years of data. The, the, the comparison is about 1.2 centimeters. 
this is over the lake, right? It's the best case scenario. All right, so I wanted to proceed and talk about the, actually the last topic. How am I doing on time? <laughs> am I okay on time, Woody? Oh, that's okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, proposition. So, uh, so this is a general statement and I won't show everything. So we could use radar altimeter, actually sympathetic after radar. I wanted to talk about uh, how do we do that. And this is not a conventional technique. So, so the science is that ash trees and wafer ties. I know in Indonesia, there's a lot of mango forests as well. So, so some of the uh, saw has to be probably L band so that it could penetrate and hit the water in a double bounce scenario. You will see that, and then the GPS with atometry, and and you you saw before. So, I'm gonna do some uh, examples of ties in you know, Amazon and uh, uh, for poacher and and then move on to the sand barn, which is in Bangladesh wetland. So, he, so here are the points in the Amazon, these are the tracks, and I want to be a little, little bit quick. So on the, on the first point, which is a JSON point, we, we did a tidal analysis. So this is the altimeter data, and then we use the data to, to fit ties. But see, this is like way not in the ocean, in the river, right? So actually river ties is pretty big in the Amazon. So this is a very good scenario where you actually make a 75% signal reduction if you do ties. So for those of you who are doing river um, hydrology, actually you have to remove ties because uh, they would they would contaminate your hydrologic signal, your discharge signal, your storage signal, because uh, it is topography track. So uh, here's another JSON two. Actually, this is even better signal reduction, meaning that ninety percent of this altimeter data, which is in blue, are really ties. All right, so let's move to the Bangladesh region. So this is Dakar, this is Bay of Bengal. So, so here you also see a 75% reduction for JSON2, and you see a 95% in MVSET signal reduction. Uh, so, so this is just an exercise using radar altimeter. By the way, the point is way in, inland. In, so, so these are two examples. Other examples like uh, it's pretty famous is Colombian wafer in the United States and, and elsewhere they have ties. So I actually see it with my naked eyes, I think is uh, around here. So you have the wafer in the winter time. And uh, so when we, before we go out to lunch, uh, the, the height is pretty big. After we came back, um, actually, you could see the bottom of the wafer. So the, uh, it's about a meter down. And there's no other mechanism except ties because there's no, no uh, gates stopping the wafer. So this is a tremendous uh, physical phenomenon. All right, let me just do this very quickly uh, for the GNSSR. So, so with atometry using SNR. So my student, uh, Jensen, did the work. As I said, Christine Lawson is the first person who published this 2013, how long ago, seven years ago. So uh, this is uh, actually, if you're familiar with the geography in the United States, I should make a plot. So this is Western United States. Seattle is a, is a city in the state of Washington. So there are two stations, there are two GPS points. Somehow it's very close to each other, only 35, 38 meters. Um, so that's the uh, number five, RPT five, RPT six. Uh, so, so this is 38 meters. And then this is in Tacoma. If you ever land in Seattle, you get into you know, the airport. It's called a Tacoma airport. So this guy is actually uh, near the, the ocean also. It also measures the GNSSR. So we could use this technique to measure water level. 
actually away from the ocean. So the idea is that, um, so actually we'll find out that sea level does not really agree with this sea level because of the tides. That's our uh, hypothesis. Uh, but we actually have no way of telling, uh, have another uh, explanation because you need a model because this is a very small area. You have to really do a time modeling, hydrodynamic modeling to verify it. So I, I will just um, show the results. So if you recall, uh, the tide gauge is about uh, 13 kilometers away. So you could see a large difference actually. And these, these, these two is like about 38 meters away, pretty close to each other. So you could see the, the light pool, the tidal uh, signal differences is like half a millimeter usually, you know, like less than one centimeter. So it's, it's basically uh, agreeing very well, but, but again, away from the, uh, let me just show this again. So what I'm trying to say is that we use the data, the time series to do ties. The time model over here and the time model over here disagrees. So we argue that these data, these two um, actually had different ties. All right. So let me uh, go to the last topic, uh, which is the synthetic aperture radar best scatter. So the terminology called best scatter, meaning just actually exactly the same as uh, radar altimeter. By the way, radar altimeter has SAR altimeter as well because it's delayed Doppler. Uh, but uh, synthetic aperture radar actually look to the side, it's not the nadir. So, so this is this is elementally a uh, SAR sort of we, we, uh, refraction physics. So when when the uh, radar signal reflect on this big tree, it could be mango forest. It just get also you have no data. And then you also do these uh, different refraction, it gets back. You can only measure the treetop. It's called volume squaring. Somehow if your, your signal penetrates these, these trees or these herbs in a wetland, so you hit the water and the, and the water bounces to hit the tree trunk and then go back and satellite catches it. This is called a double bounce. And um, so, so basically the explanation is that if you see the blue line of water go up, this signal from the back scatter will be different. So in that way, you can actually measure this, uh, the so DB or back scatter and then build a relationship, you could actually measure the, the water height change in the wetlands. So it only works for that with a lot of uh, trees and wetlands, this mechanism. So we try to see a hypothesis, uh, see whether it works. So we talk about ties, right? So this the sand, sand bonds is the wetland and mango forest is a huge uh, region. So, so this is a picture of the high tide. Actually, I'm not sure whether the same picture, I grab it off the web. I think I acknowledge it yeah, here. So this is supposed to be the same region and then low tide. And this happens twice a day and once a day. So because the tide has frequencies of 12 hours and one day. So here's the region that we we're talking about. So this is region, well, the, the, it's Bengal, right? Bay of Bengals. You have the Bengal tigers. Uh, I don't know whether you know, um, I think there are tigers in Indonesia too, right? Malaysia, the tiger swims. I don't know whether the tiger in Indonesia swims or not, but um, I believe it's the only, only place that the tiger swims. Um, if you throw a cat in the water, I think they will die. All right, so let me just go through it quickly. So here a study area. We actually use the altimeter combining with the SAR because remember we have to build a model. So to build a model, you have to calibrate the best scatter 
amplitude with some real height. You could obviously use a tie gauge to do that, but there's not a whole lot of tie gauge. So here's the mango forest. You can see it's very complicated and we have two tracks. So I, I won't bother you with um, all these uh, SAR scenes. This is done by uh, Yuan Yuan Jia, uh, our research associate here. And, and this is like Japanese uh, pausa. So, so this is L-band. So L-band actually could really penetrate. So we have problems with, uh, with uh, C-band, um, not to mention X-band will not work. Okay, I'll, I'll just skip over about all these uh, slightly, it's not detailed actually, but the, the flow chart of how to do this. So again, this is not doing INSA, uh, but INSA is also done trying to classify the vegetations and so on, which I won't. So this is actually an animation. Uh, oops, sorry, let me show the animation. So, so we have about 20 best scatter coefficients. So, so, so this is dB over here. And as I said, it translates into, somehow it stopped, okay. So you could see that it flashes through. It is non-evenly uh, space time. So you could see, uh, uh, actually complicate a change of dBs at which you could translate in the water level. So this is just the animation of the signal and it, it repeats over again. So what we did was actually we want to go a step further. We try to build a time series and then we would do time models. So we actually use the, the satellite altimeter over here at these points to, to make a model to basically, when you measure the best scatter coefficient, we change it to, we use the model, a linear, inverse linear relation, you change it to the water level change, right? So, so that's the model over here. So I just show about uh, six of them. Uh, remember I have uh, 20 of them. So you could use a composite model or you could use every different model. They are almost the same, the regression. So this is a very good one. This is okay, this is okay, this is not so good. And this is uh, better than this, but not so good. And this is okay. So we basically build a model. You could see that vertical axis is actually what was measured by the satellite. So you have an inverse relationship with the height, meaning minus seven, uh, let's just say, dB, and then this is like 0.8 meter water height. So the variation actually goes pretty pretty high. So it's like 2.2 .2 meter to about 0.8. So, so about one meter fluctuation of the water is pretty high. Actually, it's because of tides. Excuse me. So we actually it. make a composite model, and then you can see with averaging, although the error bar is big, uh, somehow this uh, average water. So, so here's our model. So what we did was, we use each of the 40 meter wet solution uh, water level height change and, and uh, use this is the SAR data and then try to build a water uh, time series in a wetlands. Excuse me, CK, you have another last two minutes. Okay, all right, so finishing up. So I just wanna show you the, the ties, actually the red, it's actually um, different points that we have there. Um, so each of the point to show, but actually the time model is valid over this region. Uh, we, I think we average uh, to about 100 meter sort of spacing, but still it's pretty high resolution. I think this is it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sham, for the uh, very interesting talk. And this even make our uh, context wider from just the satellite altimetry. We go through uh, SAR techniques, uh, even the GNSS reflectometry, which is really, really interesting. And at the end, uh, we wrap it up with the, with the combinations of these topics. So thank you again for, um, for your kind um, uh, willingness to give us a talk.
to give talk to our webinar. So now we are coming to the uh, question and answer uh, session. We, we, we used to have about 20 minutes to 11, but now we're already at 11. So let's, let's see how many questions we can cover uh, during these sessions. Uh, there are a couple of questions that already been asked. For example, the one asked by uh, Pak Suparjo from Indonesia, um, but it's already been uh, uh, responded by uh, Dr. Nuru already. So Pak Suparjo was asking about um, what's the techniques or how can we uh, combine the techniques uh, that we talked about today to study about the earthquake. So if you have uh, some insights on the earthquake, uh, maybe you can uh, give us some information, Professor Shan. Oh, uh, using altimeter to detect earthquakes? Is that a question? Uh, not, just, not just altimeter, but any others. <laughs> OK. As a matter of fact, this will be the forefront of the research. <clears throat> um, I think large earthquakes actually possible if you try to use altimeter over the ocean. Uh, you have to compute the gravity change. Um, we recently did a study uh, with collaborators in China. Uh, so she actually used altimeter data, basically the, the along track gradient. Uh, in Japan, uh, before and after a volcanic eruption. So he, uh, we argue that we actually see the signal. So I wonder whether that's uh, what uh, the, the person who make the question is talking about. And for Grace, uh, uh, actually you could see a very large earthquake, for example, the Sumatra earthquake. Um, so that was actually uh, first published by using Grace data. Uh, in 2006. Uh, by the way, I saw a question that how do you assess the place? They are all free, actually. You, you, all you need to do is to search for Grace data online on Google or on any Yahoo. You'll find the data product. Actually, they have very, um, they have visualization uh, data product where, where you can actually get the very high level data you know, and you could uh, point to a region and then they will send you the solution and then you could download the data. So they call it mass con solutions. So there are many, many solutions and they are tools as well. So if right. you have questions, you can actually ask me also. Uh, I have an email address. Sure. Um, maybe uh, Dr. Nurul can ask something about uh, the experience on SAR deformation study uh, related to the earthquake, Dr. Nurul. Um, thank you. Um, it's just that um, uh, probably it, uh, there's nothing much that I can share, but I just wanted to, um, to share that there are one students from ITS in Surabaya coming in, coming to UTM last year for her, um, the, she, she was in the beginning of a P master studies where she conducted the land deformation studies, but uh, she, she didn't really use the altimetry. But instead, she used the the, uh, the SAR interferometry uh, to see um, to, to 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 see this uh, land deformation uh, in in Surabaya. Yeah. All right. All right then. Uh, thank you for the response, Professor Sam and Dr. Nuru. Uh, we have another question here in YouTube channel. Uh, one of the uh, participant here uh, asking about uh, his uh, Rizky Dimas Permana from the uh, Sumatran Technological Institute, so ITERA, we call it here, Institute Technology Sumatra. Uh, he has two questions here. The first one is, uh, what's the difference between the coastal altimetry product and a sea level product from marine, marine uh, Copernicus, uh, the product from Europe, right, from the EU? 
So maybe this question goes to both of you, Dr. Norul and Professor Sham. And the second question is, um, he has done a validation of the two products and the result uh, is that the marine Copernicus product has highest, higher accuracy against the type gauge in situ data. So uh, if Rizky uh, wants to uh, make the questions more, more clear, uh, you can you can uh, you can unmute yourself and then talk directly to Dr. Nurul and Professor Sham. Otherwise, uh, they can just uh, directly answer the questions. Is Rizky there? Oh, uh, it's, it's on YouTube. I'm sorry. So she cannot answer my question in Zoom. So you can just uh, respond. Uh, to our, uh, um, I, I, I think that the first question is, uh, she, he is asking about what is the difference between the coastal product and the marine data in the Copernicus, um, if I'm yes. not mistaken. So um, as far as I know, the, the, coastal, uh, the coastal altimetry products that uh, I've, I've shown before, is from the Aviso Aviso website. Uh, and meanwhile, um, and and in the Aviso, uh, the data, the coastal data product that's available is uh, uh, on is from the JSON uh, from the more on the from the, the conventional altimetry, like from the JSON uh, pistache and Piki product. Um, but for the marine Copernicus, um, um, was where I download my uh, SAR altimetry data, which is the, the Sentinel-3A and Sentinel-3B. So these are two different websites. And uh, through the marine, the, the Copernicus, um, that one is on the GPOT, um, uh, European Space Agencies. Um, and we you can get access to the... Uh, uh, what so called like um, open open uh, online sources where you can also conduct uh, basic data processing uh, in that uh, platform. Uh, I hope that that answer your question, Risky. Yes, and uh, second question, Doctor Nurul. Um, what is actually second question, Pak Budi, Doctor Budi? I don't really yes. really get the question actually. Okay, I can repeat it again. So, um, Rizky mentioned that uh, he has done the validation of the two products, and the result is the marine Copernicus product has high accuracy against the type H in situ data. So, uh, maybe you can uh, have a comment on this uh, phenomenon. Uh, well, yeah, that is actually what we are expecting uh, from the, as I said, that we have this uh, low resolution mode of altimetry and another one is the SAR altimetry. So on the Copernicus uh, is, uh, um, is uh, basic from the, the SAR altimetry, which is Sentinel-3A and 3B. And we, yes, we are expecting uh, better performance of the data from the SAR altimetry instead of uh, the um, coastal product uh, from the low resolution modes. So I think that the results, it sounds uh, reasonable and logical, and it is actually what we might expect. All right, so it's quite clear uh, from Dr. Norales' explanation. Uh, Professor Sam, you have another extra explanation for those questions? Uh, can, sorry, can you repeat the question? Is it the... Uh, yeah. I um, quite catch the question. Sorry. All right. Uh, someone has done the validations of the two products and the results is that the marine Copernicus product has high accuracy against the tight gauge in situ data. Well, um, actually, I don't know exactly how to comment. Uh, so basically, the question is whether the in, in the ocean, in the coastal ocean, where the satellite altimetry should be more accurate than in situ data? Is, is that the, the sort of the question? Yeah, probably uh, it's already been uh, answered by Dr. Norrell as well. Okay. That okay. is already expected like that. <laughs> All right, so can we move on to the next question? Uh, there is Dr. Uh, no, this is uh, my colleague, Rustam. He's asking to Professor Sham, 
if you have any experience on the modeling of the wildlife habitat by uh, SAR remote sensing or something? So that's a very good question. I, I haven't done that before, but I could imagine that if a certain wildlife correlated with water level, um, or actually the, the maybe the, I don't know, the density of the, the mango forest or, or, or in the wetlands, then you could somehow, um, so, so basically, um, Wildlife probably would prefer water if it is dry, then wildlife would move somewhere else. So that's the only, only thing I could uh, relate to. Um, so I don't know whether I answer your question. So, so basically using this geodetic data or maybe uh, imagery data, you could find out where are the water in the wetland uh, and how do the water change? you could sort of correlate to where the wildlife is and, and the duck probably would go away uh, if there's no water, meaning there's no food, right? All right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Shem. We move on to the next question. Actually, uh, Rustam is one of my uh, close colleagues in the field that we usually do the research together. So um, this is a good uh, progress for us to collaborate more. So another question comes from uh, Bing. This or he or she is asking about um, uh, what's the current applications of the satellite altimetry in marine geohazards? Probably in terms of predicting the marine marine uh, landslides or something related to that. Do you have any comments on this, Dr. Nurul or Professor Shem? Um, so marine landslide, do you mean undersea landslide? You know, like volcanic uh, earthquake seismic uh, landslide? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, satellite altimetry is probably, would be very difficult to measure undersea sediment change is, I think that's what you meant, right? Um, however, um, as I, if, if the if, if the submarine um, like volcanic eruption is is big, you can actually measure sort of gravity, but that's uh, that's quite uh, difficult to measure. Mm -hmm. And whether you, whether you could use gravity and gravity, uh, you mean gray state, is it doesn't have a wet solution to do that. So so the method I mentioned. So, so by the way, why uh, altimeter measures the ocean surface can actually measure the, the, the gravity or the bathymetry. So this is, this is a, 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 the so-called accidental science. When people, uh, when previously launched satellite altimeter, they were thinking about measuring the marine gravity, but um, um, scientists like David Samuel, Walter Smith, Annie Kosanoff, they actually Think, thought about do a, a very classical technology in geodesy, which is basically uh, downward continue to the sea floor and then invert for the for the changes. Because ultimately the, the sea level actually responds to whether you have a mountain in the ocean or a valley in the ocean, you could see a dip if there's a there's a trench in the ocean. So by that logic, you could actually measure the gravity. So the, the, when you talk about hazards, uh, so this is change of gravity is even harder to measure, just like grace is more, uh, grace could measure the signals. Um, that's more difficult to measure by using a regular sensor. I don't know whether I answer your question. Uh, so there, there are many, many um, applications people can nothing of, or it's not originally designed, for example, altimetry or, or GPS for that matter, right? Mm. Um, so you could, a lot of times you have a science or application. A lot of times mm. you could figure out a very ingenious way of processing data and pull out the signal. Thank you for the explanation, Dr. Shang. Uh, just out of curiosity, what's the resolution, resolution of bathymetry that we could get um, from? 
bathymetry. Okay, yeah. So so this is this is as so right now you look at the ultimate trends. So that that would be the best solution you go for. But uh, every satellite, almost every satellite ultimate before they die, uh, now all the space agencies making it to be non-repeat. But still, I, I do not think that it's going to be better than, like, I believe, 20 kilometers or maybe 10 kilometers. Uh, David Samuel has a paper. I think he put it at about 10 or 15 kilometers cross track. So um, the next altimeter, the, the wide swath, that's going to give you a very, very high resolution. Uh, but again, the bathymetry, you can only invert for the high frequency. So in other words, the low frequency, you're not sensitive to. I see. All right. Thank you. High frequency meaning, you know, mountain uh, ridges and, and so on. But there's a problem in the coastal region because our team is uh, less accurate and it's covered by sediments. So you can actually measure the, the, the um, geological structure underneath, uh, underneath the sediment, but, but, you, um, but the seafloor is really covered by all these uh, sediment, soil and, and so on. Thank you, Professor Sham. Uh, Dr. Nor, do you have any words to add? Um, well, I think uh, that is a, a, a clear explanation from uh, Professor Sham, uh, but it's just that probably we look at the uh, the climate change impact where we can usually monitor the sea level rise using the satellite altimetry. This is a very good tool where we can have, uh, because we already have about 30 to 35 years uh, long terms of data time series, uh, then we can actually get a very uh, good estimation of this about the on the sea level rise. And um, usually this can be related to the coastal um, um, management or, or um, up, uh, to, to monitor these uh, coastal geohazards, for example, like we look at the uh, impact to the coastal erosions, uh, coastal inundations, and flooding. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sam and Dr. Nuru. I see one last question from uh, Dr. Johnson, Duban Gaul. You mentioned using CAWRES RES in Southeast Asia, uh, resulting the RM, the R, RMSE of five to 18 centimeters. Uh, from your opinion, uh, how how is the strategy to decrease the error in this uh, area? Maybe this uh, specifically to Dr. Nuru, right? All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Johnson. Um, all right, so it is, this is about chorus, um, the, the, the expert system where that we develop with uh, back in uh, Newcastle University with uh, Dr. Professor Dr. Zhao Li Deng. Um, and actually, um, at this stage, we are still trying to improve the performance of the chorus. And we actually now working on chorus 2.0. Um, in which in this uh, chorus 2.0, we're trying to improve that our RMS error um, mm -hmm. to, to get a better estimation, uh, particularly in terms of the offset reduction. You know, we, we embed that neural network to uh, conduct a, a, a more assessments to understand this behavior of the offset. Uh, we, we now have so many, uh, we put so much efforts to see how these offsets values uh, varies. Uh, and also uh, in terms of, uh, because we also saw another factors that affecting the, uh, the, the accuracy is the variations of the significant wave height. Uh, so yeah, um, we are working uh, on chorus 2.0. And hopefully uh, we can come up with a new paper uh, in, 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 in journal paper next year. It is halfway to, to go through on the simulation results. 
All right, uh, continuing that question, uh, there's another question from Bing. It's asking about how, is there any plan to incorporate more retractor into the Taurus uh, system? And oh, what's the biggest yeah. challenge uh, faced when the... Yeah, incorporating, but uh, incorporating more retractors, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, we we would like to incorporate all of the coastal retractors that we have because we got so many new coastal retractors these days. Uh, but what what the what interesting uh, one interesting uh, findings that we found when we conducted this uh, retracking performance over the Southeast Asia is that we found the ice retractors is performing much better than the physical retractors of the MLE4. Uh, when we compare that with the, the tight gauge data, so ice retractors is actually meant for the inland water, but it has been widely used also to the coastal. Uh, and yeah, uh, in, in Chorus, uh, we, we try to em embed uh, the, the existing, the ice one retractors from the uh, standard product uh, into the chorus system, but uh, others like uh, um, Alas or other retractors, um, we we do not have a plan to add it uh, because uh, it is going to make it the, the system becomes getting more complicated and takes a longer time to reprocess uh, our data. So the strategy is just, is that uh, to analyze how good is uh, how significant is the performance of a retractor, and then we, we if it is it is excellent, then we'll bring it into uh, the chorus system. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Norul. So I see no more questions. So if you don't mind, can I ask a question to Professor Sham or, or Dr. Norul at yeah. once? <laughs> okay, uh, let me uh, share my screen a little bit, just two minutes or something. So hopefully you can see my screen already. So in the screen, uh, you can see uh, some part of the East Kalimantan or East Borneo that has some peak region. So uh, with the dark green color there, this is the image from Sentinel-2 imagery. Uh, these are uh, some peaks that we have in East Kalimantan. So uh, we have a lot of interest to, uh, uh, to do the research in this area. And the question is, um, do you think, maybe from uh, to Professor Sham first, because the area is quite small. So from this, from the most left point to the most right, uh, like from the west to east, it's just about 20 kilometers in extent, in the length or in the width. So do you think uh, race uh, information can still help uh, us to identify how much or how deep is the pit in this area? So can you, if the length or width is just 20 kilometers. Yeah, can you tell me what is the red again? Are these uh, features? The red Flux. features are the uh, um, open, open area and usually it's coming from the uh, oil palm plantation that's still doing uh, land clearing. So yeah. they are clearing up the vegetations and they are now going to plant yeah. it with the oil palm. But then the dark green are the remaining uh, pits in this area. And we are actually have a lot more in uh, North Kalimantan and even more in West and uh, Central Kalimantan with the wider extent. So how do you think about the using the trace to right. detect this? Uh, yeah, Grace has the 600 kilometer pixel, right? Versus your uh, Sentinel-2 is uh, how, uh, five meters, 10 meters, is that? 10 meters, Professor Shang. 10 meters, okay. Yeah, so so this is very different scale. Uh, however, I, I know that you're studying forestry, right? I believe, um, let's see, who was there? There was a paper uh, in Indonesia, I believe. Uh, so, so forest fire, Although a very big scale, but but Indonesia has a huge forest, right? Uh, or Amazon is larger, but Indonesia is also 
so grace actually could detect what is dry and what's not dry. And my understanding of some of the forest fire is that some forest fire could start burning and you cannot see it. It's, uh, I forgot the terminology and you are an expert. So sometimes it started burning and nobody knows until it's too late. Uh, at a very large scale, grace potentially you could actually sense the dryness. Basically, you, you're losing. So the, so the, the, the fattest triggering a fire, of course, is temperature and then lack of water, right? Dry soil moisture. So this is exactly what we could, could see, what could sense underneath the very thick forest because your optical imageries, your uh, whatever, uh, even radar, you can't really see the bottom, uh, but uh, grace could. So maybe think about that. However, I, I guess it's very cost uh, scale. There's a way of down scaling uh, the grace signal uh, however, you know, the most you could probably do with a believable would be 25 kilometers or maybe 100 kilometers. But it is definitely a tool that people are, are talking about. You know, there was uh, sensing like hidden forest fire is very fake. You can't see it, but somehow or, or like, like you could use it to predate forest fire using some index, right? So. To me, that's a very legitimate tool. Uh, thank and, you. Uh, there's, a, there's one kind of satellite. And it. Resolution, but the significant thing is that they argue, they argue they have daily sample. So we, we've done some research on fire and on other hazards like flood. Uh, it, some, of the, some of the data is actually uh, like a daily sampling. It's very impressive. Okay. Thank you very much for the response, Professor Shang. Uh, is there any participants who want to ask a question directly? To the to our speakers, S3, uh, any matter related to geospatial information? Anyone? Yeah, okay, then um, I saw a lot of uh, participants here coming out from uh, East Kalimantan, even from some coming from Malaysia, I guess. Uh, there are some people also coming from other provinces. But most of the participants right now uh, are coming from uh, Mulemar University. So at the end of this uh, talk, at this webinar, uh, I will kindly ask Pak Anton of the Institute of uh, Research and um, Community Services at Mulemar University uh, to kindly uh, provide us with the closing remarks and closing ceremony if you are still in this meeting. Pak Anton or Buonis, are you monitor? Okay, seeing none, then um, I'll, <laughs> I'll dare myself to uh, conclude our webinar today which is very, very informative and uh, comprehensive. Uh, one big uh, message from our uh, rector is that we have to increase our collaborations in research and also uh, in community service. But in this case, probably we'll uh, do more on the research collaborations with uh, Dr. Nerul and Professor Sham in the future uh, in many kinds of uh, schemes. So we have the schemes of visiting uh, scientists, we have the scheme of postdoctoral research, we have the schemes of collaborative research with the mutual uh, funding from both sides. So hopefully uh, in the future we can uh, talk about it uh, in a very much detail uh, to involve uh, many more uh, scientists from uh, Mulawaman University. 
also we thank you very much for uh, Mr. Hafid uh, from S3 Indonesia to give us a very good sense on how geospatial information is uh, used by uh, coastal and um, marine applications. And by um, thank you uh, by uh, saying thank you to our uh, great and almighty God, we are uh, closing this webinar uh, with a very good appreciations to the speakers, Professor Sham, Dr. Nurul, and Pak Hafid, and also of course to all of our participants today. So. Here I'm closing the webinar and feel free to uh, uh, greet each other and open, on, open up your mic to uh, say hello to uh, other scientists. Thank you very much and have a good day. Stay, stay healthy, stay clean and keep away from COVID-19. Thank you very much, uh, Pak Budi. Thank you very much, Dr. Nolur, Pak Budi. Terima kasih, Pak Budi. Most welcome, Bu Nurul, Pak Johnson, Pak Afid, Pak Professor Shem, and everyone. We had fish yesterday for dinner.